So talking specifically about seizures and brain tumors, one of the most common symptoms in both gliomas and cerebral metastases can present with seizures. There is a greater incidence in primary tumor versus metastases. So primary brain tumor, you have higher risk of having seizures versus a brain metastases from another type of cancer. The incidence of seizures is higher with low grade versus high grade tumors. So this is kind of opposite of what we might think. Um, in one study, in a review study of 1,028 patients with brain tumors, this was the breakdown of the prevalence that they found in seizures. So in the low-grade glioma group, approximately 85% of those patients had seizures. In anaplastic glioma groups, approximately 69% had seizures. And in GBMs or glioblastoma, the most aggressive form, there it was a 49%. So it's kind of an inverse relationship between the grade of the tumor and the seizure risk. Um, in general, seizures are less common in brain metastases versus primary brain tumors. In a retrospective study of about 470 patients, 24% were diagnosed with seizures at some point. So already the numbers are much lower than we saw in the previous slide with the um, gliomas. The most common was with uh, metastatic melanoma at 67% of those patients. And the theory behind that is that um, melanoma tends to bleed and then blood becomes an irritation on the brain and they theorize that the irritation is causing the seizures rather than the actual tumor sitting there. And the least common are the metastases related to breast cancer at about 29%. And in an, in another side note about um, things that could look like seizures in brain tumor patients are, is passing out. Syncope um, in brain tumor patients is actually related to increased intracranial pressure rather than the electrical storm that we were discussing. And sometimes it can be confused with seizures because there is a loss of consciousness. And sometimes when people pass out from increased intracranial pressure, when they pass out, they do have like the tonic-clonic jerks with it. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish just by history whether or not it was a seizure or it was a passing out episode. But it is important to identify what the underlying cause is because usually syncope related to increased intracranial pressure is treated with steroids and possibly neurosurgery versus the anti-epileptic medications. And just a quick slide about autism and seizures. It is known to coexist in people with autism and the prevalence rates in the literature are reported from anywhere from three to 40%. And there's such a discrepancy in these numbers because one, I think the diagnosis of autism is difficult. And in those patients, sometimes they have repetitive behaviors that can simulate seizures. So sometimes unless really extra testing is done, it's hard to distinguish whether they're behaviors or true seizures. So that's a whole other um, ball game in terms of trying to figure out what those movements are in these patients. So in general, potential risk factors for seizures is your underlying IQ. Severe mental retardation does predispose people to having seizures. An abnormal neurologic exam. So when you go into the neurologist's office, even if you have something really like on the MRI that's showing that you have a tumor or a demyelinating lesion from multiple sclerosis, your actual exam may be normal. Or you may have one little tiny thing in your brain in the right place that shows an abnormality on your clinical neurologic examination. So people with abnormal neurologic examinations on clinical examination tend to be at higher risk than people who don't have those abnormalities. Or an identifiable syndrome, and we'll talk about some of those epilepsy syndromes as we go through the lecture. A family history of seizures, because there are some seizures that have more of a genetic component History of head trauma puts you at higher risk for, um, of, um, of seizures. And then the history of brain or spinal cord infections or tumors.